SJC 12525, Commonwealth versus Lopez. Mr. Shaw, good morning. Good morning, Chief Justice Ganson. May it please the court. My name is Robert Shaw. I'm privileged to appear today on behalf of Jean Carlos Lopez. I'm going to do my level best this morning to at least get to the first three issues in the case, beginning with sufficiency and looking at what the evidence does not establish, why the evidence from Kayla Lawrence and Janet Deneen do not get us over the threshold for sufficiency, and how the Commonwealth's presentation to the court ignores overwhelming evidence that they presented concerning what really happened in the case. There's no dispute in this case that Jean Carlos Lopez arrived amidst a highly charged event that was fully accelerated and already in motion. He joined a chase of the victim at the tail end of the beginning portion in a parking lot but there is no evidence in this case that he was one of the two individuals who chased the victim up Weir Street, reversed directions, then chased into a driveway and into the backyard. There's no evidence that he was present in that backyard or that he was involved in a stabbing. Well, wasn't, wasn't Kayla Lawrence uh, somebody who said that he was in the backyard? No, she said that she said that she couldn't see into the backyard and that she was in the driveway and never went down the driveway. And so uh, there is no evidence that he was in the backyard from Kayla Lawrence, nor is there evidence that he was ever, in these facts, aware of a knife or that he had noticed that a stabbing would occur. There are two witnesses, Matthew D'Alessandro and Brittany Machado, who had front row seats to everything that happened on Weir Street and exactly what happened in the backyard. They described what happened and who the, was the, there, and it the, didn't the involve The knife was wielded out in the, uh, in the parking lot, correct? That's correct, but there's no evidence that Jean Carlos Lopez had driven up at that point in time. Now, two about witnesses. 12, about 12 stab wounds, is that what it was? That's correct. Right, so what if, um, what, what if in the light most favorable of the Commonwealth, uh, he's, uh, he's present and he continues to participate after the first stab wound? What about well, I don't think you have that in the evidence, and this is why. There are two witnesses that the Commonwealth really wants to hang their hat on. There's Janet Deneen and Kayla Lawrence. They don't change the state of the evidence, and I think it's important to focus not just on what they say, but what they cannot say. When asked what she observed, Janet Deneen said that she described three people, black clothing and white clothing, exactly corroborating D'Alessandro, D'Alessandro identified the clothing of Etnit Lopez, white t-shirt, Irving Cruz, black tank top. He watched the entire thing in the backyard. He watched the incident. Deneen never saw a bright baby blue sweatshirt. But she with, saw a third person. I'm, excuse she saw me? saw a third person. I'm sorry? She saw a third person. She may not have seen the defendant, but she saw well, a third she person. Well, she described, well, she described. Somebody consistent with maybe, what's his name? Uh, uh, Garnum. She described three people, but she admits that when she first reported this to the police, that's what she did. She described three people in the backyard. She then spoke to people, and she admits that then she reflected, and this is her testimony, her actual words, I then thought, there had to have been four people. So she assumed that the victim was on the ground and three people were hovering over the victim. However, D'Alessandro watched it. He said, no, there were three people in the yard. There were two assailants in the yard and the victim. Etnit Lopez, white t-shirt. Irving Cruz, black tank top. Victim, black jacket. That's what was there and that was consistent with their first description. Even if you believe and you say, well, I feel that we have to credit Janet Deneen, that there were three people. There's no, nothing that identifies Jean Carlos Lopez. In fact, all of the evidence would indicate that if it was anybody else that was in there, it was Jared Brown Garnum, who was also wearing dark clothing. But it doesn't identify Jean Carlos Lopez. Her testimony is also incredible because she says that the attack went on for 10 minutes. We know it went on for less than 60 seconds. She claims she found the victim in the backyard. We know that's not true. She actually put on her bathrobe and left five minutes after the attack to go outside. So, she, so that, that also undercuts her testimony. And that brings us to Kayla Lawrence, an immunized witness. That would, day or pretty much, because they weren't expecting to call her, were they? 
I'm sorry? They weren't expecting to call her. They were expecting to call Garnum like they did with the other trial, right? I think, I th I th I think they probably were. But Garnum although... died the day before the trial was to start, right? That's correct. Uh, but again, I don't know whether they prepped Kayla Lawrence. I mean, they certainly had, uh, according to the attorneys, um, engaged in some course of conduct and wanted her to testify in a certain matter. But uh, if it, you know, she was asked, describe the order of people running down Weir Street after the victim. She can't say. She doesn't know. So she says, well, everyone ran after him, which, of course, was true in the parking lot at the beginning. What driveway did they run into? She can't identify the driveway. How long after the attack, they ask her, did the victim fall to the ground? She says, well, I didn't see the attack. I was in the driveway up by the street. I couldn't see the backyard. I couldn't see a fence. I didn't see a spotlight in the backyard. Afterwards, she admits, did Etnit Lopez run from the backyard? Yes. Did Jean Carlos run from the backyard? I didn't see Jean Carlos run from the backyard. The prosecutor asks, well, was he still back there? She says, well, I don't know. I didn't see the backyard. Then there's this question where they say, well, what did you see Jean Carlos do? And she says, and this is really what the Commonwealth is focusing on, quote, the way I remember it, close quote, he just kicked him. And that's it. No context, totally uncorroborated, totally isolated. She's still saying she didn't see the attack. She's still saying she was in the driveway. It's in conflict with all the other evidence. The fact is that her being in the driveway and not seeing the backyard is actually corroborated by D'Alessandro because he watched the attack in the backyard and he said there were two people in there attacking the victim. There was nobody else there. He was clear. And Janet Deneen also says, I heard a woman, but I couldn't see her because she was in the driveway. Does Kaylin Lawrence say where the attack occurred? Well, I think, you know, her testimony is that what she, she saw, her testimony is that she was in the driveway and she couldn't see the backyard. So she's essentially placing herself up by the street in between two houses in this driveway. That's what she's saying. She's saying she didn't view the attack. So when she says she saw the defendant kick him, do we know where that occurred? We really don't based on the testimony. I mean, and, and it's just, again, it's, uh, it's inexplicable. It, it, it's, it's almost as if she's saying what she's got to say because she knows she's going to be prosecuted for perjury if she doesn't tow the government line. And there were some indications that that was a real issue in this case. Now, now we've got the bandana and the cell phone in the Grumpy's, the Grampy's or Grumpy's? Uh, Grampy's. Grampy's and driveway. Grampy's parking right, lot. Right there, right. Uh, what inference is appropriately drawn from that? I think the inference that is appropriately drawn is that, and, and if you look at Kayla Lawrence's testimony, at one point she says that there was some running back and forth near that shed, which was near the um, Grampy's parking lot, but which is off the cameras, and that's where the phone and the bandana were. So something, there was some sort of clash or something that happened there, which obviously, uh, I suggest to you, stopped Jean Carlos Lopez, and that's exactly why he wasn't one of the people who ran after the victim up Weir Street and then reversed directions and ran into the backyard. He did run after him to some extent, didn't he? Well, he in the after... beginning, he joined the chase. He drove up. And there, was, and there was evidence in the video from the video camera on the way back. He was also heading back with, uh, with somebody. He came back, but he was, I think, what was it, 12 minutes, 12 seconds after Irving Cruz, which shows that he was separated. And there was other evidence that someone had, after these guys had run into the driveway, somebody had ran further up Rear Street to Bow Street that circles around. Okay, and it was the former prosecutor who was then a judge who testified that he had received that information. Now, so, uh, it's, help me a little bit. The ages of these people, including Cruz, is the oldest, correct? Yes, Cruz was much older. Uh, D Alessandro and uh, Machado were very detailed in their testimony. They said that he was bigger, he was older, he was in the black tank top. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm not able to tell you specifically the age just, of Just of, ballpark. Of the I, I gather we're uh, talking about kids. 20, 20, 20 early and then 20s. Cruz would uh, be in his 40s. One of them's a juve, was it was 17, I think, under 18, because he was, uh, uh, Etnit Lopez was convicted. But we can infer that Cruz was slower than the others, probably. Uh, not necessarily. 
not necessarily. Isn't there something wrong with one of his ankles? I'm sorry? Didn't they, did they, when you look at it, doesn't he look at it like he has something wrong with one of his ankles? Cruz, looking at the video, he looks like he's limping a little bit. Um, not that I recall. Okay. Not that I recall. So, um, Mr. Shaw, you've got the knife out in the parking lot. You've got... Knife out that then just disappears, just very briefly. Yeah, I understand, but it's out in the parking lot. Yep. You've got um, the defendant in the chase. The defendant was the... Uh, the, the victim of the earlier assault, right? Right, and that's... And so you got a motive issue. You've got at least one witness saying four people, and then you've got, I understand a, whether there's a personal knowledge issue going on here that you'll, you'll tell us about, but at least um, that Lawrence is saying uh, he kicked him. And then you've got 12 stab wounds with an inference, particularly if you take into account he kicked him, um, uh, that he's present at the time and uh, continuing to be involved. The kick is being involved. Well, you don't know when the timing of that is, but I understand what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, so I, I guess, and 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 clearly uh, the, there's, there's evidence uh, that he's in the chase. So At the beginning, right. So I guess the question is obvious. If you take all of that together and pour it into the Lattimore standard, is that enough? I don't think it is, Your Honor, and I think one of the reasons for that is that when you look at all of the evidence and you look at Machado and D'Alessandro, who are their star witnesses, they see everything that goes on on Weir Street. I mean, they have a front row seat to this, and he is not involved. Matthew D'Alessandro sees the stabbing. He watched it. He heard what people were saying back there. And, and, and there were two people involved. He describes them specifically. There's no ambiguity in this. And I think it's very important to take into account that this incident, this isn't an incident where there was premeditation. This isn't an incident where there was some big plan. You have Jean Carlos Lopez driving up into a situation that has spontaneously arisen. He has no foreknowledge. He, 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 he jumps into the middle of this. Um, they're chasing, he starts, at the front end of a chase, and that is what the evidence is, front end of a chase, and whatever happened at that shed, and that's it. Now, I think it's important to contrast this with what the Commonwealth tells the court. The Commonwealth, in their brief, says three people chased the victim up Weir Street, Weir Street unsupported. They say Jean Carlos participated, uh, was, was in the backyard. Again, nothing places him in the backyard. A stabbing occurred, and Jean Carlos continued the attack. Again, this is unsupported. If you look at their presentation, you will see that they look at Machado and D'Alessandro, and in their statement of facts, they, they start with, they turned onto Weir Street, and then they skip to they heard screams in the backyard, and they omit all of the observations that were made. And these are their primary star witnesses in the case. And I think that that speaks volume. So I think that this evidence is simply insufficient to establish beyond a reasonable doubt that Jean Carlos Lopez intended to kill anyone, that he participated in a killing, that he had notice that a killing was going to occur. Now, with respect to the joint venture statements, there are two sets of issues. The first is admissible. Be, 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 before, yeah. before you get to mm -hmm. those, uh, Kainla drives up with Garnum and Etnid. Correct. Right. Etnid, uh, then Kainla gets dissed by Hollingsworth. Right. Uh, Etnid, we don't know whether, we, we don't know whether the motive was the dissing of his girlfriend or the fight, which you say was, th was three and a half years ago. Yes, and, and didn't involve uh, any retaliation, okay. no weapons, but, clearly but, no but, serious. But we, we know that dissing a girlfriend sometimes triggers of course. such things, so he's chasing her, then the car comes up, do we, uh, from the video, is there a sense that the car was just driving or was a sense that, the, that somebody had called somebody and that the car was sort of speeding up and Well, there is no, sp I, I think they were looking for this kid, Christian. I okay. actually think that, that, that um, they heard that he was at Grampy's, so probably the car was driving up. There is no specific evidence that there was some sort of phone call about 
what was happening. And when Irving Cruz gets out of the car, he says, is that him? Is that him? He probably thought it was Christian at that point. He was probably wondering, is that Christian? Oh, I see. So, the, that so is that him arguably probably. could be ambiguous as to what they were referring to? Because probably. they were looking for Christian. Yes. Okay. So then who's driving, by the way? Uh, 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 no, Gene Carlos was driving the car when it drove up. So, so Gene he Carlos is driving. Cruz is the passenger. Cruz gets out first. Right. Cruz starts the chase. Right. And we then know that the defendant gets out and he's chasing. And he follows along. And Garnum was in the other car. No, yeah, and Garnum was in the parking lot too. He was in the car that Kayla had driven. Uh, well, it was actually Miss Tory that had driven that car. Tory was, and, okay, and, so there were and, four. It was, and and, and, and Jared was, Brown Garnum was also there in the lot too. Because he was there in, the, in Miss Tory's car? That's correct. Okay. And, and then, according and, to Kayla, he also began the chase. And does the video reflect that Garnum chased as well? I don't think it reflects that, but that's what the testimony was. Testimony from whom? Um, Kayla Lawrence indicates that he ran after him, and then, of course, you have all the admissions that Jared Brown Garnum made. Okay. So then based on D'Alessandro and Machado, he's running down Weir Street and then turns back. Well, actually, they're, they're, they're facing the, the convenience store, so they see everything that's happening in the lot. They see... Um, um, Gene Carlos's car drive up, and then as they turn on Weir Street, that's when the chase is happening right down Weir Street. So they're running parallel, and they're actually watching because they're afraid when they turn into their driveway, they're going to hit these guys, and they're watching the entire thing. Matt D'Alessandro is, is, is actually watching, and then as they turn, the, the people running almost hit their car. They reverse direction. He watches them. They now run back because the victim reverses direction. Back towards Grampy's. And then they turn right into a driveway, into the backyard. So he goes back towards Grampy's. Yes, back towards Grampy's. Then, and then Hollingsworth takes a right. Hollingsworth, right, in, in, into the driveway and then into the backyard. And then th what happens is they're turning, and so they both arrive at the same time. And that's why Matt D'Alessandro, the spotlight comes on. He looks into the yard, and he watches the whole thing. And he listens to the statements that are made. Now she has no, his companion in the car, she doesn't see it because she's blacked out, right? At the some point she blacks out. Well, she, right, she they says she covers her ears, right? She, she doesn't want to look, she's afraid. And then she gets out and he's already kneeling down yeah, next yeah, to the yeah, victim. Yeah. So she didn't really see anything. She, she didn't see anything at that point in time, that's correct. Okay. She just heard a scream. And, and the driveway that Kayla said that she drove to, where is that in connection to the backyard? Do we, um, do we know? Was it clear enough? Yes, yes. And I provided a, a map for you in, in, in the brief. But yeah, the, 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 the driveway is, leads basically to the backyard. And then, so there's a house, and then there's a driveway on the left, a driveway on the right. They run down this driveway. D'Alessandro and Machado are driving down this driveway on the opposite side. Okay, so they're both the parallel. Yes, yes. Uh, but she says she can't see what's going on in the backyard. Oh, that's correct, because Kayla. Kayla only walks up and she says she's near the street in the driveway, so she's between two houses, and she can't see that far down. And during the course of the questioning, when, they, when she said that she saw him kick him, was there no eliciting as to where, she, where that occurred? Really, there, there isn't, as I recall it, and as I present it in the brief, it's, it's, it seems almost inexplicable. And again, when you look at it in context, it's in conflict with anything else. And of course, that's, that's the problem we have with having an immunized witness and, and, and not requiring some sort of meaningful corroboration. And um, I think that she was under a lot of pressure. She had a young child. She didn't want to lose that child. Um, you can imagine that you know, she wanted to be sure um, that she wasn't going to get arrested and prosecuted. Mr. Shaw, the, uh, the, uh, two of the uh, three alleged co-conspirator statements, the first two, yes. Commonwealth uh, suggests that, that they're not um, assertions, but, but even if they are, even if they're offered for their truth, why, why aren't they clearly during and in furtherance of the conspiracy, and it seems clear that if, uh, if uh, your clients involved that independent of those statements, there is a conspiracy. Why, the, why, why not if they are hearsay, they're not within the exemption? Okay, thank you. And, and, and there, there are two issues regarding this and hopefully I'll address them both. The first, admissibility. Mm -hmm. um, 65. The statements in the backyard, there are two sets of statements. 
concerned a venture to kill. We don't dispute that. The sole evidence of what those statements are came from D'Alessandro. He watched the entire incident. He heard the statements when he was watching, and he's absolutely and clear. Two people, he identified them. It's Etna Lopez. It's Cruz. It didn't involve Jean Carlos Lopez. That's what the evidence of the statements is. There was nobody else involved, he says. There was nobody else there. A straight application of the law demonstrates that the ruling was wrong because a joint venture statements have to involve a cooperative effort, must include the participation of Jean Carlos Lopez in furtherance of a common goal. But there not in furtherance of the, but they don't have to be part of the actual conversation. If it's during and in furtherance and they're already on the train. That's right. That, well, that's true, but again, there has to be a community of activity and interest at the time the statement is made. And, and, and he simply, look at the evidence that D'Alessandro provides concerning those statements. Jean Carlos Lopez is not a part of it. But when they admitted those statements? Weren't they, wasn't the judge pretty careful and didn't do it until Kayla Lawrence testified that the, the, the defendant was there? Well, I think that the, the, the judge, um, the judge, um, he, he, Completely, if you look at his, you know, his decision, as I point out in the brief, I mean, he completely misunderstood the testimony of Kayla Lawrence. He, he thought that Kayla Lawrence provided testimony that she didn't provide. But I think that goes sort of to the next issue involving these statements, which is very critical, which is the jury instructions involving the joint venture statements. The jury instructions were clearly erroneous, and there are three fundamental problems with them, none of which the Commonwealth um, responds to because the Commonwealth says, well, we believe he was part of a venture and therefore the instruction was appropriate, but they don't address the content of the instruction. And the first problem with the instruction is that the judge intentionally crafted an instruction directing that the jurors could use the backyard statement, the most, the worst one, which was, which was a statement that was made during the act of killing, hold him, hold him, don't let him go, immediately followed by um, the, the strikes or during the strikes. And the judge crafted the statement, the, the instruction, so that they could use this against Jean Carlos even if he was absent from the backyard and even if he only had the intent to commit an assault and battery. And, 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 and you know, because the judge ruled that the evidence was consistent with Jean Carlos having an intent to commit an assault and battery based upon what he did. In, in the parking lot at the front end of this. Now, the judge actually explained that that was his intention in crafting the instruction and diverting away from the, um, the, the, the model instruction that we have. But you know on the second, on the second point that the uh, co-conspirator statement, assuming during and furtherance in the conspiracy independent of the statement, it doesn't have to be the conspiracy of that particular crime to be admissible. Well, Your Honor, I, I think that because at the front end of this, uh, what we have is we have only evidence that supports, and the judge ruled that there was only evidence to support an assault and battery. To say that he intended, based on the evidence, only to um, assault and batter, but to then use a statement that is clearly part of a, 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 the act of killing, the intention to kill, against him, you have a real problem because you're inviting the jury to conflate the intention of the lesser crime with the malice required for murder. I'm perplexed. Get him, get him, don't let him go. It's not offered for the truth. Hold him, hold him, don't let him go. Hold him, hold him, okay. Hold him, hold him, don't let him go. It's not offered for the truth of the matter. Right, and it, and it, and it doesn't matter, really, that it isn't offered for the truth of the matter. I think there can be a lot of technical arguments about that, but the reality is that you are using somebody's statement somebody else's statement against Jean Carlos Lopez as evidence of Jean Carlos Lopez's state of mind. So at a minimum, you have to have relevance that carries the day, which I don't think you have here, and you have to do a 403. Uh, you know, there has to be, um, um, you know, probative value that outweighs unfair prejudice, and clearly you don't have that here, especially when you're inviting them to conflate the two um, standards of state of mind for the lesser and the greater offense. Well, isn't the proper instruction that you may consider it against Mr. Lopez only if you find that he was present in the backyard and heard those words being said? And as I've indicated, the judge 
crafted the instruction so that the jury could use the statement against him even if he wasn't in the backyard and even if he only intended to assault and batter based upon having tried to join the chase at the front end of this. And, and that leads to the second part of what the judge did because- but Before you go to that, was there any objection to the admission of those statements or any request for a limiting instruction? Yeah, there, were, there was an objection to the admission of the statements. Um, I think, I, I, it's not clear to me, I don't think, there may not have been a specific objection to the jury instruction as it was given. But th th the second part of, of the jury instruction problem is that the judge, with respect to this, intent to assault and batter only required a conspiracy. And he distinguished a conspiracy from a joint venture for some reason. And he defined a conspiracy as a mere plan. And that's a problem because he's omitting the requirements of a cooperative effort, an effort in furtherance of the common goal. And so now we have, not only can Jean Carlos be absent, he doesn't need to have an intent to murder, it can just be an intent to assault and batter, and then on top of that, we also have that it only needs to be a plan, there doesn't need to be any conduct in furtherance. And then you get to the third problem, which is that he completely omitted other basic elements of the instruction, never required that there needs to be a foundation independent of the joint venture, which is part of the typical instruction, and um, that statements need to be in furtherance of a common goal. And if you look at what he did, then there was a second set of statements. I think your, your, your time is up, so. Okay. There's the uh, second set of statements, and again, he, he, he changes the instruction for the second set of statements in the backyard. So in closing, Your Honor, again, we believe that there's insufficient evidence here. And if you, we're, we're asking the court to rule that it is legally insufficient. If you cannot do that for whatever reason under the law, we're asking you to exercise your authority under 33E in order to ensure that there isn't a miscarriage of justice. All right, thank, thank you. you. Mr. Nito. Good morning, thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. May it please the court. I'm Stephen Nato on behalf of the Commonwealth. <clears throat> Excuse me. As the defendant, says in his brief and at argument this was a chaotic incident. Uh, it escalated quickly from an argument at the Grampy's convenience store into um, that, the violent attack in the backyard of Weir Street. Uh, and the jury had some conflicting evidence and issues of credibility to resolve. Uh, and they were well positioned to sift through the various testimonies, decide Everyone here saw something, no one saw everything, but a synthesis of the testimony uh, would show that three people engaged in the beating of... Uh, you, you say synthesis, and you have a very short brief for a very serious issue of sufficiency. So articulate what is the evidence which you believe is sufficient to find that he was in the backyard and participated in the attack with the intent to kill. So uh, Ms. Deneen testifies that as she witnesses uh, the fight from her perspective, she sees three people um, in the backyard hovering over uh, Mr. Hollingsworth, or the kid as she d describes him. Uh, their hands are going, they're really going after him. He's trying to get up, they won't let him up. Um, and then... Okay, let's, let's stick with her. Does she... Do you agree that Mr. Uh, Lopez was wearing, Mr. Shaw says baby blue, I assume that means light blue. Was he wearing a light blue? Yes, that's my recollection. Okay, does she give any, does she identify anyone wearing a costume? I, I know she says there's somebody in white and somebody in black. Uh, does she identify any other color that would be consistent with Mr. Lopez's presence in the backyard? Not specifically. So, but how, so, so how, how do we know that? Let's assume. I mean, let's assume she saw th three people. How do we know that that third person was Mr. Lopez as opposed to say Mr. Garnum? Because then the jury could consider that this testimony of three people, and then in light of that, cast it against Miss Lawrence's testimony that the defendant was involved and that he at least kicked um, the victim during this altercation. They could have determined that her recollection that this was in the driveway, not the backyard, was mistaken. Uh, if a witness's recollection were 
dispositive or their certainty of their own recollection was dispositive, there would be no reason for the jury or need for the jury to, to weigh those things. Okay, well, let's, let's, so with regard to Ms. Deneen, I gather all that she adds is that there was one more person in the backyard in, engaged in the assault than Mr. D'Alessandro and Ms. Machado saw. Yes. So, so that, that gets you the third person. Correct. But it doesn't get you who the third person is. Until you factor in Ms. Lawrence's testimony. Okay, and then Lawrence, I gather, says she couldn't see in the backyard. Yes, well, that's what she testified to. Okay, is there any, is there any indication that the, the killing occurred anywhere except in the backyard? I, I, I don't think so, I, and I think certainly that was the Commonwealth's theory that that's where it happened, but again, the jury could make the determination, again, she's, it's a mistaken recollection or the testimony is just wrong, but she saw the speeding, if she must have seen the beating, if she saw the defendant kicking him and in the course in the, of it. And that's in the driveway to the backyard? I'm sorry? That's in the driveway? That's her testimony. I'm sorry, she saw him kicking him, kicking the victim in the driveway? Well, well she does. So the, as, as I understand it, there's an altercation at the Grampies, and then the next altercation, or the only other altercation, is in the backyard of the of the Weir Street house, Correct. right? And the, the eyewitness says there's three people in the backyard, right? Yes. And the cooperating witness says that the kicking event or the defendant's involvement is in the driveway of that same backyard, or no? That's where I'm confused. Where's the driveway? I, I, I think which, that, that's, which driveway is it? I think it's, the, is it the? Is it the driveway closest to, to Grampy's or 148? Weir Street, I think the address is, but it is seems- it the, Is it the same driveway that leads to the backyard? That's, that's my recollection of it, but now, um, I don't recall exactly, but it sounds like these driveways just run into- Well, it, 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 I'm looking at the map that, that Mr. Shaw provides, and there's a triangular looking block. There's two retail establishments at the points at two ends, and then 150, 148 Weir Street's in the middle. Correct. So uh, the question I'm asking you, the place where the victim was killed, that's in the backyard of 148 Weir Street, correct? Yes. Right, where's the driveway that Lawrence said she saw the altercation? I, well, I, I think she must, was, or at least Mr. D'Alessandro recalls her coming sort of down the driveway yeah, but when, up there. But, but when Lawrence testifies on the witness stand, I'm sure the ADA had a map or did whatever. Where, where's, the, where's, the, where's the driveway? Uh, I, I think it was 148, but... All right, we'll have to look at the record. But that's not my... I, I don't recall specifically, and right. I apologize. Um, but... Again, in a case like this where it's happening fast, it's chaotic, um, memories may not be exact. The because you, you see the problem, if the, if the driveway is not 148 Weir Street and it's some other driveway, there could have been three altercations, right? Sh sure, yes. Or it could have sort of progressed through the backyards. And then you got a problem. Uh, I suppose if that were conclusively established, maybe, but that, and that could be an inference the jury made, but we're not required in any of that. And as far as the third person in the backyard, there are people other than um, the two co-defendants and the defendant involved in this altercation? Is, is it not by the process of elimination it has to be him, or could it be somebody else? Well, for, for instance, Mr. Garnum is nearby uh, throughout this, um, and if the jury had found, you know, Miss Lawrence incre not credible on a certain point, or Miss Deneen's memory not uh, satisfactory on a certain point, they could have said, well, that was uh, Mr. Garnum. Uh, but again, not required to draw that instruction, and just as reasonable to say, um, in light of everything, we credit Miss Lawrence's testimony that the defendant was involved in this, the physical violence. So uh, su for sufficiency, you need both. You need Lawrence's testimony about the defendant's involvement in an altercation. Where that is, we'll find in the record, and you need the witness's identification of at least of three people, not two. I, I think so, um, in, in this can, case. Can I, um, 
Can I ask you, I, th I thought that Ms. Deneen also gave a description of clothing of the three she, people. She did. And that the, none of them was the baby blue. That's correct, but. It was consistent with what we saw in the uh, videotape of Garnham, wasn't it, the third one? I, and not consistent with the defendant's clothing? I, I believe so, but again, testimony as to color yeah. may have. So she says three. Now, does Lawrence say three, or does Lawrence say four? Garnum plus? Pardon me. Um, my recollection is that she sort of generally testifies that I think everyone was involved, or everyone was part of it. Meaning um, everyone in meaning four, or meaning three? I, I don't remember if she counted uh, my... But what, what, what is part of it? How are we supposed to, what, what's a jury supposed to take from being part of it? I mean, yes, he was apparently involved in the chase and arguably would be guilty of assault. I, I mean, if that, that were the extent of Ms. Lawrence's testimony, maybe it wouldn't be enough. Find out what more, I mean, I guess all that she gives you is that she saw the defendant kick her, kick him, but we don't know where the kick was, and we don't know when the kick was, and we don't know, and she says she couldn't see into the backyard, which was where the killing occurred. So what, what's the best you're gonna do from the kick? It, it establishes that he's involved in this melee that results in the victim's death, and as, again, in light of Mr. Neen's testimony, that there are three people really going after this kid, holding him down. Um, you know, she describes it as 10 minutes, which is, is not consistent with the timing of it based on the surveillance video. Uh, but nonetheless, it, the takeaway from that is that this was long enough uh, that it wasn't just, uh, you know, they punched him and ran. This was a beating uh, that occurred. And there were three people involved. And uh, Ms. Lawrence directly places him as involved in that. Let, let me go at it another way. Where was Ms. Lawrence's position when she made this observation? Uh, her testimony was that she was a little bit down from the top of the driveway. Um, a little bit down from the top, meaning towards the street, or? That, that's how I interpreted it. And, and again, the driveway of 148 where? I think so, yes. Um, Is that clear from the testimony? But, reg I mean, do, do, do you agree that the, the, the inference would have to be that she was at, at a vantage point where she could see something in the backyard, although I guess she said she didn't see something in the backyard. Yes, and if it's a continuous progression from, uh, you know, the driveway into the backyard, um, you know, she's, this isn't her house, she doesn't know the layout, she, in, in the nighttime she may not be appreciating a distinction between the driveway and where the yard begins and ends relative to the driveway. Um, again, this was a quick thing, uh, chaotic, but she directly says the defendant kicked uh, Tegan Holling Hollingsworth. Um, the other witnesses, uh, I think, pretty clearly describe Etnid and uh, Mr. Cruz. Um, and then adding Mr. Neen's testimony, it's certainly a reasonable inference to be like, well, that third person uh, was the defendant. Who right, but you need um, Ms. Lawrence that she saw a kick. And M Mr. Shaw's position is that if you take all of her testimony, it's clear that she doesn't have personal knowledge to have been able to make that observation. I, I, what I took from uh, the appellant's position is that there's no foundation uh, in the evidence that would provide personal knowledge for that observation. Well, I, I think she said she saw it. No, I, I, what I'm saying I, that that if you juxtapose that statement with the rest of her testimony of what she says she saw and she didn't see, and you you take the rest of it, that that the light most favorable to the Commonwealth indicates nonetheless that she doesn't have personal knowledge that she was not able to observe what the kick. That's their position. You understand that's their position, right? Well, I, I think... They're saying she's, there's, there's no foundation for her to have been able to say she saw it. Well, except that, again, as I explained to Justice Gaziano, her placing of this as happening in the driveway 
could simply be mistaken in that. No, I'm just trying to ask the question in a different way than Justice Gaziano asked it to try and get at the point that what in the light most favorable of the Commonwealth allows us to be able to say that she actually saw the attack where it occurred. Can I just clarify? Um, did she say she saw the kick, but she didn't say where, or did she say she saw the kick in the driveway? I, I think she, she's generally describing her observations and her placement as she's sort of at, right, but then without going to the specifics, she yeah. then says. But she was specific in saying that she couldn't see the backyard. Correct. Or, 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 again, that's what she said. Um, but those, those are, could be credibility determinations, determinations about uh, a jury's impression of the witness's recollection, how well it's... To, in, in a light most favorable to the government, you have the defendant joining in the altercation at Grampy's. A knife is wielded in the parking lot. The victim's chased. The defendant is involved in that. They end up at 148 Ware Street, one witness sees the defendant kick the victim in the driveway. That witness now is useless. The, 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 um, the fight then goes to the backyard of that same residence, and now we've got another witness saying that we've got three people, the defendant being implicated as a third person, I guess, by inference. Um, uh, where they deliver the fatal blows, correct? Correct. And that's very generously putting it all together. I'm sorry? That, that's, is that your theory? It, it's essentially, yes. And, and whether the evidence is that, you know, the escalation started in the driveway where the defendant's kicking, and then based on Mr. Deneen's testimony, they infer that this then continues off into the driveway where now Ms. Machado can't see them, but nonetheless, the assault has continued. Un, un, even under all that analysis, how do you get anything beyond an assault and battery? Uh, because the... Uh, or the intent, the joint venture the for assault beating and continued, uh, again, for a long enough time. For, for instance, Ms. Deneen testified this kid was trying to get up. Uh, they weren't letting him down. There were 11 stab wounds. The beating continued. Uh, well past the first one in that case. Um, and Mr. Machado described vividly that agonized cry that of desperation. Uh, so, so this the, wasn't- so the, the, the intent forms during the, 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 the uh, backyard altercation, even if it was, even if it starts out as an assault and battery, it certainly escalates when, they, when, they, when they're holding the guy down. Correct, and the defendant's determination or his continued participation even as it escalated. Is um, that the kick? What was his participation other than the kick? Uh, in light of uh, Ms. Sunin's testimony, the jury could infer that he was part of the general uh, beating that continued as uh, Mr. Hongsworth was trying to get up. Uh, they wouldn't let him up. Well, 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 let me ask you, when she saw him kick, when Ms. Lawrence saw him kick the, the victim, was the victim down? I, I think that's my recollection. Or the, Again, how I interpreted the evidence. I don't remember if she said specifically that he was down or not. Um, how else could he have done it? I'm sorry? How else could he have done it? Just kick him as he goes past? I mean, but to, I, mean I don't think he was kicking him in the shins or something. So my, my, uh, my recollection is that he would have been down at the time. Okay. Um, or how I read. So uh, that, that would be how they, you could tie it in. I'm sorry? That would be how you could tie it in with the um, murder. C correct, correct. If I'm, looking at, think, oh. I'm looking at her testimony, transcript 6, page 81. It appears that she's describing a fight that's in the driveway. Was there yeah, a fight yes, in the driveway that occurred before they went into the backyard? And it may have started there. And, and again, I think there is a possibility that she was mistaken um, about exactly where what was occurring was, in fact, occurring. The way I remember is just he kicked him, okay, and did you see where he kicked him? No. What was Ticken doing in response, trying to block it? Was he on the ground? Uh, this appears to be a fight on the driveway. As soon as I hit the driveway, I saw them fighting. She said she couldn't see in the backyard. 
So do we know whether there was a fight in the driveway before they got into the backyard? Uh, again, again, I can't remember if uh, Mr. D'Alessandro says it started in the driveway and continued, but I, I think regardless, there's still a reasonable inference that uh, either Ms. Lawrence is describing something that happened in the backyard that she may have been mistaken about or misrecalled, or the fight started in the driveway uh, with the defendant and he followed it um, into the backyard. Uh, so whichever of those inferences may be, uh, both are reasonable, both support uh, the conclusion of guilt in this case. And the, the, uh, the other issue is when she's on direct examination, there's a question about where she went and there's a, a reference to the Exhibit 3, which I assume is an aerial photograph, and she just says, we went into a house. There's no, we don't know which house it is, right? Right, and, and so again, it's sort of the sense, she does, it's not her neighborhood, she doesn't know exactly where she is, uh, but the jury can cast it in light of the other witnesses' testimony, put the coherent story together. That there only had to be one house that was involved, right? Right. Um, and, I, and I think significantly as to um, these inferences being reasonable or the synthesis that the jury made being reasonable uh, was that we don't actually have any direct evidence that uh, the defendant was not involved. Uh, so you, even uh, Mr. D'Alessandro and Ms. Machado may describe uh, certain clothing being worn. There's no then the next step of, and this person in the baby blue was, you know, smoking a cigarette in next door or something. And but really not the defendant's burden though, right? I'm sorry? Really not the defendant's burden to show that he was not involved? I'm, I'm sorry, Your Honor. I'm <laughs> not, not usually the defendant's burden to show he was not involved. True, true, but, but just right, but under it, the uh, standard, there's no, uh, there's no evidence conclusive that he is not uh, part of this or not present on scene. <laughs> Having said that, if uh, there are no other questions from the Court, uh, I see my time's just about up. I'll rest I, I, on the brief. I guess to go one last question. Uh, sure. The statement, the, the so-called co-conspirator statement, uh, hold him, hold him, don't let him go. Uh, could that be used against Mr. Lopez if he did not hear it or was not in the backyard when it was said? Um, I, I think, well, it's not hearsay, so it wouldn't be... Uh, right, but, but uh, is it re relevant as to Mr. Lopez's guilt unless he heard it? I, I think it's relevant to what, you know, what's going on during the fight on the scene, that this isn't, you know, they're not looking to just smack him around and scare him and send him off. They're, this, this is a beatdown, essentially. Uh, Certainly relevant to their intent. To, to the intent to kill the people who were involved in killing him, but as to Mr. Lopez, could it be relevant as to his guilt unless he heard the statement? I, I don't and, think you... And, and therefore understood that there was an intent to kill. Uh, where the factual evidence establishes the joint venture, I, I don't, he doesn't need to hear it um, as long as it's made during the pendency of the joint effort and in furtherance of its goals. Um, so you can, I mean, that can happen sometimes in conspiracy cases where that are more complicated, where the principles aren't always involved for every piece of a criminal conspiracy, but nonetheless, the statements which are evidence of it may be admissible. But it's not offered for its truth. Correct. Okay. I think it's just part of the setting. Okay, thank you. Thank you.